Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yeah, he never saw it coming. And welcome, Genies, to Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. We hope you enjoy this classic rewind of Extreme Genes. We'll be back after the first of the year with new stories and new expert guests to help you in your genealogical journey. Happy Holidays! I'm really excited to let you hear from Heather Mayo Smith today. She is my guest for two big segments. You may have seen her on 60 Minutes because she's done all these interviews with survivors of the Holocaust and uh, done these over five days in a special thing they call the Dome. And anyway, they answer virtually every question you could possibly ask a Holocaust survivor so that after they're gone, people can actually ask a question and they respond to it. And get this. She's going to make a version basically where anybody can do this to preserve their own family history. So imagine 100 years from now, one of your descendants asking essentially a hologram of you about your life and everything you'd like to tell them about it. So we're going to have that coming up here in about 10 minutes or so. The back end of the show, Melanie McComb returns to do Ask Us Anything this week. We've got your questions lined up, and we're looking forward to helping you out as you continue with your genie journey. Right now, it's time to head out to, uh, let's see, Stoughton, Massachusetts, the home of David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. How you doing, David? Uh, everything at the Lambeth Manor is doing just fine. How are things with you, sir? <laughs> you know, it's been fun keeping really busy. In fact, uh, last week I had a, an interesting breakthrough with a little carte de visite of my second great-grandfather, Fisher. There, oh. Yeah, there had long been speculation about when that picture was taken. I had a, a clothing expert guess that it was in the 1850s. I kind of wanted mm-hmm. to know how old he was in the picture. And uh, I took it out of an antique frame, and I was going to put it in a, in a sleeve instead with some other stuff. It was just time to make a change. And I hadn't looked at this card in uh, over 25 years. And I thought, well, I'm much more educated now than I was then. Let's see if I can figure something out. So I looked right. on the back of the card and saw the name of the photographer. And so I researched that in the New York City directories and found she was at that address. It was a woman photographer, interestingly. Uh, from 1857 to 1867, so a 10-year period. But there was also a revenue stamp on the back of this photograph. And oh, that, that narrows it. That helps that. a lot because those were issued yep. only between 1862 and 1871. That was to raise money for the Civil War. So that lopped mm-hmm. five years off the beginning of the time period that this picture could have been taken. So now we're down to 62 to 67. Then I studied the stamp and learned that that particular stamp wasn't issued until October 12th of 1864. Now we're down to late 64 to 67. And then I found out that photographers protested the tax on their photographs and Congress put an end to it as of August 1st of 1866. So the window is now from October 12th of 64 through July 31st of 1866. So right about 1865. And it was just a fun little exercise and really interesting to me that these two clues could basically help you narrow down the window. Yeah, and some of those photographs, because I collect antique photography right around that same era, the CDVs, they're date stamped. Like they had a little stamp, looks like a postal mark. Yes. Or they put their initials and the date on it too. So sometimes if you don't get the photographer's name, their initials or their, their last name or something is enough to give you even an additional clue when there's no back mark to where the photographer is. Sure. Yeah, th- this particular photographer wrote her initials on it. There's no date, but still, it was it was pretty interesting to, to go through the exercise. Maybe that'll be of use to somebody to know that with photographs, uh, they were only taxed from 1864 to 1866. So if you've got that revenue stamp on there, you've really narrowed down the time period. Well, it's time to get on to our family histoire news, David, and we're really kind of stuck in World War One because there's so many similarities to what's going on right now. I thought maybe we We'd start with the World War I recipes. <laughs> yeah, let's cook on with that one for a little bit. I, I think Granny Clampett would approve. Uh, 
If you remember the Beverly Hillbillies folks, you may remember that Granny could fix a skunk and also fix a possum. Yep. And yes, there's a possum recipe that was popular back then. They talk about how people were raising chickens in their backyard in cages, and they normally didn't raise chickens, you know, in little back alleys. And you know, <laughs> and they had certain days where there should be meatless days, and meatless days, and porkless days. Crazy. It's just a great article on ExtremeGenes.com. you got to check it out. Yes. All right. Next, they got the midterm elections in November of 1918. We've, of course, got the presidential election this year. I'm seeing some similarities as to what's going to be going on. Well, I can tell you people will probably be wearing masks, as you know, they're saying there's a possibility that this could upswing again in the fall, right in time for the election. Yes. And in 1918, they only had about 10 percent less from the previous midterm election, so they got 40% of the voter turnout the previous year, 50%. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. I mean, as I was thinking about this, if they can do the U.S. Census electronically and securely, why can't we do voting that way? So that might be a possibility, too. Boy, you are correct, sir. I love this story about the uh, diaries in Ohio from 1918 that are helping some people in that area get through the current pandemic. Yeah, this lady's great-grandmother kept her diary between 1899 and 1964, 65 years or almost her entire lifetime. And it's just a little pocket diary, and sometimes it's just talking about the weather. But this family out in Ohio is using it to kind of get through the current quarantine and the pandemic we're experiencing now. And this is perfect advice, again, to shout out to all our listeners if you're not keeping a journal. You're missing an opportunity of recording history for your descendants down the road. Absolutely true. Well, American Ancestors is always interested in interacting with you. And now we're on Twitter. And if you go to Ancestor Experts on Twitter on Tuesdays at 3 p.m., we have a tweet live uh, where we talk about all sorts of things about what you can do while you're home and just exciting topics in genealogy. Catch you there, and catch you on Extreme Genes next week. All right, thanks so much, David. And coming up next, I'm going to talk to Heather Mayo-Smith. She's put together a project you won't believe, and it may have a spinoff to something that you're going to want to use at some point in the future. That's coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. At Legacy Tree Genealogists, we provide families like yours with the stories of your ancestors, a legacy that will be cherished for generations to come. Legacy Tree Genealogists provides genealogy research for clients worldwide, helping them discover their roots and personal history through records, narratives, and DNA analysis. And when your research requires access to on-site archives in the countries your ancestors lived, Legacy Tree Genealogists has researchers in more than 100 countries around the globe who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogists is the recommended research firm of genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Check out what our clients have to say. Absolutely the best. They communicated through the entire process, and my report arrived on time. The story of my family with supporting documents was very fulfilling. Tom G. Google Review. Don't wait any longer. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. You know, whether you're new to family history, a seasoned pro, or you've simply missed the event in years past, now's your chance to connect at Roots Tech Connect, the world's largest family history conference. For the first time ever, this event is 100% virtual and 100% free. That's right, virtual and free. Now you can discover your heritage from wherever you are. Imagine three full days of discovery, dozens of classes to choose from, taught by presenters from around the world, all from the comfort of your couch. Oh, and don't forget the exciting celebrations of music, food, dance, and traditions from around the globe. Enjoy inspiring keynote addresses and learn from top-notch speakers and see yourself in the story of the human family. Discover your story. Discover Roots Tech Connect. Live online February 25th through 27th, 2021. Register for free at rootstech.org. That's Roots Tech Connect, free at rootstech.org. Well, genies, what a time we're all going through right now. And with all this time on our hands, you probably agree the best lemonade we can make out of this is to sharpen our genie axes 
and learn how to extend our family trees, gather more photos and documents, and discover those remarkable family stories our descendants can benefit from for generations. Well, I have more time now, too, and I want to help you learn what you need to know. That's why I've created a new Facebook group, Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. I'm so pleased that so many of you have already signed up and are helping us to create a supportive community of family history researchers. On this page, we can brainstorm and share ideas on how to tear down those brick walls that we all have. So feel free to join us. The Facebook page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Feel at home with others who live in our genie world and want to make the most of this unique time. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Join us. Well, just a few weeks ago, you may have been watching 60 Minutes and a segment with Leslie Stahl about a unique project going on at USC, what they call the Shoah Foundation there, which was organized by Steven Spielberg some time back. And she visited with a woman named Heather Mayo-Smith. And Heather has put together a project interviewing survivors of the Holocaust and in a unique way where you can actually go and speak to the person in this recording and they will answer your question. It was such an intriguing thing. I knew I had to track her down and I went to a great trouble and now I have all of your personal information, Heather. And <laughs> I'm just delighted you agreed to come on the show and talk about your project, Dimensions and Testimonies, that you started in 2009 and now everybody knows about it. Thank you so much for having me. So tell me about this. How many Holocaust survivors have you interviewed so far? For Dimensions and Testimony, we interviewed 22 Holocaust survivors, I believe. And how many of them are still living? 20. 20 of them. So you've lost yeah. a couple of them. The way you do this is so unique because you've built this thing that some people call the dome. Other people mm -hmm. call it the sphere. It's all yeah. these cameras from all these different areas. And then you can verbally ask a question and they will answer it because you go on with them for like five days of interviews in the same clothes. Yes, that's key. <laughs> they don't wear the same undergarments, though, so that's good. <laughs> well, that, well, I saw Actually, where we you have, have a, like five sets of shirts, all the same, right? Yeah, or we have that kind we have thing. multiple. Yeah, we buy multiple. If you should see the the salespeople at Nordstroms when I go in and I say, "Okay, I like this pair of pants. Now I need." four more <laughs> exactly like it <laughs> like what <laughs> that's fun tell us yeah. how it started how do you got going in this and how you found your initial interviewees oh the holocaust field for years and years has been wondering what was going to happen to holocaust education and awareness once the survivors were no longer able to speak in the public as they had been for the last good 50 years right so it's been a growing concern and my previous company was doing exhibitions for museums that revolve around the holocaust and genocide and in particular intergenerational memory mm -hmm. so i was talking with a lot of holocaust survivors a lot of families obviously generations of them at a single time and over my history i had seen hundreds of holocaust survivors speak in the public and what always struck me was the moment that they opened the floor up to questions between the audience and the, the survivor, the energy changed dramatically. And if you ask those individuals at that moment, A, what it meant to them to be able to ask their own question, and B, how the connection to that story changed once they were able to ask that question and actually have that engagement, that blew it out of the park. So what we thought was, okay, we have, obviously the USC Show Foundation has over 55,000 audiovisual testimonies and they're all in narrative form, which is the methodology they use. Sure. So it's the largest audiovisual archive in the world right now. It's an amazing archive and it will be for all time. It's a canon that we need to preserve and definitely protect. And there's no question that you can't ask that archive that it can't answer. However, it's not in a conversational form. So you wouldn't be able to necessarily engage with it as if you were being immersed in an environment where you felt you were actually with an individual, 
having a conversation, a one-on-one, -on -one, or even with a group of between 10 people and the survivor, a back and forth. You know, they wrote autobiographies. There have been countless movies. There have been countless documentaries made. None of them engage a person like a Q&A. Sure. So we thought, all right, what would it look like if we tried to replicate that Q&A experience for future generations to be able to have when the survivors are no longer able to have those conversations in the public. Um, wow. And what you've accomplished here is to track these people down so they're going to be interviewing dead people. Yes. they Well, that was one of the first. <laughs> so, so I went to the Show Up Foundation because obviously since this content was going to be audio visual and if it was going to have a life in the world after we were finished, it needed to be a Show Up Foundation project. Sure. It needed to be led by them. So I knew that going in and it took me about a little over a year to convince them that we were serious and that we could possibly do this. And you got some pushback too, didn't you? Oh yeah. One of the first remarks that I'll never forget was you want to talk to dead people? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'll tell you from the I, genealogical I, standpoint, that's what we all would love to do. Well, there you go. You 50 years from now, you'll be able to yep. talk to anybody. Like you always say, what do you say about your past? Oh, I just say we're, we're, li we're living in someone else's past. Right. Yeah. So you will you will be able to talk to anybody in your past. Yeah. So, well, we'll talk about that a little past. bit later yeah. on. Let's stay on this. So I was charged with, okay, you want to do this? A, figure out how to do it. Once we talked it through and, and they agreed it might have legs. And I think a little part of them thought that if they gave me this charge that I would go away and never come back. But, <laughs> they um, didn't know you too well, did they, they? No, no. So... A, go figure out how to do it, if it's possible, and B, what would this cost? That was kind of key. However, I had a couple of ideas. The key was to find who is being innovative, who is leading the field. I happened to find it in Playa Vista, California, the Institute for Creative Technologies. And they, at the time, were pretty much working on pushing the boundaries and pushing technology, and their primary client was the U.S. government. That'll work. So, so, <laughs> yeah. So what I originally thought that we'd use some sort of a search capability that the Shoah Foundation had already built, they actually built the first search engine for audiovisual content. So video content. So when you go on YouTube and Netflix now right. or anything, you're using the search capability that they built. So I originally thought, okay, we could probably use that. And then I was looking for the visualization. So the original vision was I'm sitting in a, in a room, maybe a kitchen or a living room with a person sitting across from me. And I'm having that conversation, that back and forth. One on one. Questions. Right. I'm asking them questions, they're sitting in front of me and they're responding. So I needed that visualization part, which by the way, has not been developed yet. So, so I met this person that was the farthest along in true hologram technology in the world at the time. And I found him at a, it was a TEDx conference at USC, tracked him down, stood in front of him. He's about a foot and three inches taller than me, about 15 <laughs> inches taller than me. Okay. And um, so if you can imagine, I'm five foot two, so I'm not very tall, but I, I stood in front of him and said, I want you to film a Holocaust survivor. And I want to be able to sit in front of that person and feel as if I'm having a conversation with that individual. And in true engineering style, and yes. picture him, he's a complete techno nerd yep. standing in yep. front of me. <laughs> in true style. You said it, he, not me. He looked right over my head <laughs> and didn't say a word. And he went into this daze, like his eyes were glassed over. <laughs> Rolling over in the back of his and, head. Yeah. And I could actually see his mind working. Oh, I mean, wow. it was just amazing. Well, and listen, we, I, we, I want yeah. we are running tight on time for this segment. Yeah. So tell me, what was the, the one story that you gained mm -hmm. from any of these 22 people that you interviewed that sticks mm -hmm. in your mind all the time? It is the first one you ever tell anybody about when you talk about this project. I can't, I, I really, that would be like picking. A, Among your children. A, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. That's a, definitely a, a Samson or Sophie's Choice thing. No. 
probably the first interviewee that we had, and he was interviewed for the 60 Minutes piece. His name is Pincus Gutter. Mm -hmm. And we've had a really long relationship with him, but he he's been tormented most of his life after the Holocaust by the fact that he cannot visualize his sister's face or remember a lot of things that he would think that he should remember about her previous to the war. So that pain, should I say, in, yes. in all of his answers with regard to the interview that we did, and he also happens to have the largest database. So his, um, his conversation would probably be the most natural conversation you could have because he has the most responses. He's a real example of the struggle to survive, the ability to be resilient, living with that, and the power of the human being to want to persevere. Wow. Most, most of them all, you know, obviously all of them had a lot of elements within that, but I think he embodies that for me personally, he's an amazing, amazing individual. I'm talking to Heather Mayo Smith. She's with the USC Shoah Foundation. She is the person behind Dimensions and Testimonies, which is the uh, the interviews with Holocaust survivors. And uh, some of them are all gone now, but you can still do interviews with them. And that's the idea is to get their testimonies preserved for future generations. And Heather, I want to talk to you about the ideas you have moving forward that may have a lot to do with what genealogists are interested in, and that's sharing our family histories in the same way. So can you stick around for that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. happy to. So, Jeannie's, as we take a break for five minutes here, just picture 50 years down the line, your descendants seeing this image of you, and they can actually ask you questions and you respond. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're going to get to when we return in just a few minutes on America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes. Welcome back. It's Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth with Heather Mayo Smith from the USC Shoah Foundation. She is the creator behind Dimensions and Testimonies, interviews with Holocaust survivors so that you can actually have an interactive experience with them as seen recently on 60 Minutes. And Heather, in the middle of that show, they made a reference to something that really <laughs> made my eyebrows raise. And that was the talk that uh, we might be able, just anybody might be able to use this technology to answer questions from descendants in the future. Because as you referenced in the first segment, you know, I always mm -hmm. like to say that we're living in somebody else's past. This right. is a great opportunity for us to share our story. And this would be a unique and totally new way in which to do it where our descendants, our great-grandchildren, second, maybe third great-grandchildren, could ask us questions about our lives and our experiences. When do you see that type of thing actually coming to pass? Oh, very soon, actually. We started a company called StoryFile. Everyone can check it out, go to the website, sign up to be a beta user on the app, and we will give you information about when the mobile app launches. What the mobile app will do for everyone is you will have the opportunity to record on any smartphone, record your own story, answering a whole list of questions that will be on the app. And those will be processed automatically and saved in perpetuity. And anyone coming in the future or anyone now that wants to get to know you can have a conversation with you and just ask you questions about your life. As far as oral history, though, the key thing is it's in your voice, right? And you are and you are telling the story, so it's your narrative. It's not multiple generations going through telling that same great story and how it gets altered, obviously, throughout the generations. It's you being able to tell that story in your own words from your perspective. Sure, firsthand. And that's yeah, and the real revolution here is. 
I can see you, I can watch your body language, which we all know is nonverbal communication is most of communication. Sure. I can get to know you in a different way than if I was reading an autobiography of you, or if my relative was telling me about you and, you know, relaying funny stories at different family gatherings about your life. It will be a completely revolutionary way to know who your relatives are and who you are because of them. Wow. So you say this may be coming sometime soon. What kind of price points do you think this app is going to have? Obviously, uh, Mm -hmm. for the masses to consume it, it's going to have to be done in in certain ways. You're not going to be able to do this, obviously, the way you did the Holocaust survivors, because that was a a massive production with uh, future uses and technologies in mind. This is the same concept, just a little bit different, right? Exactly. So it'll all be automated. You know, you can spend as much time or as little time on it as you want. You can do it in in parts, you know, you can take one script that'll be divided out into what ultimately would collect a whole lifetime of experiences and life cycles. You know, it'll be very reasonable. We would like to make it, if you're doing your whole life story and perpetuity and you want to do a single shot at it, one-time buyout so that none of your relatives have to pay ongoing costs for it, et cetera, et cetera. We're hoping it comes in around $500. Wow. There will be a couple scripts that will be free to the public. So anybody will be able to do what we call what's your story script. Think of it as I'm meeting you at a party or, sure. you know, and I'm kind of asking icebreaker questions type of thing, little things to get to know you. That script we intend to always keep free. And then there'll be other scripts that you can supplement. You can do it all at one go, like I said before, or you can do it at different stages. You could even do the whole life story at multiple points in your life. I mean, how cool would it be for my grandchildren to talk to my 15 year old self right. when they're 15 <laughs> yeah. you know, or there are things that come up in your life when you're in your 40s or 50s that maybe you didn't think about in your 20s and you want to ask your parents those questions and they've already passed or your grandparents those questions and they've already passed so you didn't get a chance to ask those questions so incredible you know, all questions about how you made decisions in your life you know what did you do in certain we're all humans and we all actually go through the same experiences. We have knowledge within us, no matter who you are. And whoever we are is a, an extension of who lived before us. That's right. So to know more about that and to identify with it and learn from that would be an amazing gift for future generations. Totally, totally. Yeah. So can you write your own questions then? You will be able to. At the first iteration of this mobile app version, the StoryFile app will not be able to. That technology actually does not exist yet. So we are building that. We're hoping to have it spring 2021, maybe summer 2021. So how many questions then are in the system? So when we launched the mobile app, when we launched the formal one, we're thinking that the scripts will total about 450 to 500 questions. Wow. Total. Why? That's pretty comprehensive. And is a lot of this yeah. based on your experience then with the Holocaust survivors? Yes, because we covered their life from the minute they were born until the day that we were filming them. We had a lot of partners. We had a lot of people that we connected with to develop these scripts. And then we refined a lot of it. For StoryFile, I've gone back and asked input from other sources and got other advisors. And we've compiled these lists based on years and years and years of interviewing people. We tried to keep it as universal as possible. Do you have questions in there where you can ask people about their interaction with their own parents or grandparents? Oh, sure. Yeah. What was their relationship like? Tell us what you know about them. What did they do? Then from there, it gets drilled down into how much you do know about them. What were their personalities like? What was it like at home? You could even get as minute as how did you see them as parents? Sure. Parenting, yeah. You know. Wow. It just sounds like an endless number of applications here. And you you mentioned not only for generations in the future, but you could also use it for meeting people today or job interviews, right? 
Yeah. There are so many people that have come to us with so many amazing ideas for this technology in different areas, you know, job interviews, FAQs. I mean, think of iconic people, expert advice, things like that. These people in those areas get asked the same questions over and over and over again. If they were all to have their own story file page that had all of those questions that people normally ask them, that would free up so much time of theirs <laughs> and so much time of the person that's actually engaging with them to get at what you really want to know. So with the app, if somebody wants to see, say, for instance, my life story, would yeah. they go to that app and then ask the question verbally and it would play? Or it, would it be uh-huh. that they click on a question and the answer oh, comes Oh, no, no, up? no. That version of it, it, museums have been doing for the last 30 years probably, but um, we wanted it to be as immersive as possible. A lot of people have said to me, is that person on FaceTime with me or are they in another (laughs) room, you know, answering these questions? So it's a very similar experience, except the responses have been pre-recorded. Wow. That's incredible. Ultimately, we want you to feel as if you are having a QA and a with an individual. So it's StoryFile. Where do people go to look into this? It's not fully available yet, but where can people look into it? StoryFile.com. That's it. Keep your eyes and ears out for it because it's coming. Well, we're going to keep checking back with you, uh, Heather, so that when this happens, we can let everybody know about it because you got a lot of genealogists right now who I know are just frothing (laughs) at the mouth over something like this. We look forward to chatting with you again down the line. Thank you, Scott. Because I have your phone number. Great conversation. Yes, you do. (laughs) Melanie McComb joins us for another round of Ask Us Anything coming up next on Extreme Genes in three minutes. At Legacy Tree Genealogists, we provide families like yours with the stories of your ancestors, a legacy that will be cherished for generations to come. Legacy Tree Genealogists provides genealogy research for clients worldwide, helping them discover their roots and personal history through records, narratives, and DNA analysis. And when your research requires access to on-site archives in the countries your ancestors lived, Legacy Tree Genealogists has researchers in more than 100 countries around the globe who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogists is the recommended research firm of genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Check out what our clients have to say. Absolutely the best. They communicated through the entire process, and my report arrived on time. The story of my family with supporting documents was very fulfilling. Tom G. Google Review. Don't wait any longer. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. You know, whether you're new to family history, a seasoned pro, or you've simply missed the event in years past, now's your chance to connect at Roots Tech Connect, the world's largest family history conference. For the first time ever, this event is 100% virtual and 100% free. That's right, virtual and free. Now you can discover your heritage from wherever you are. Imagine three full days of discovery, dozens of classes to choose from, taught by presenters from around the world, all from the comfort of your couch. Oh, and don't forget the exciting celebrations of music, food, dance, and traditions from around the globe. Enjoy inspiring keynote addresses and learn from top-notch speakers and see yourself in the story of the human family. Discover your story. Discover Roots Tech Connect. Live online February 25th through 27th, 2021. Register for free at rootstech.org. That's Roots Tech Connect, free at rootstech.org. Well, genies, what a time we're all going through right now. And with all this time on our hands, you probably agree the best lemonade we can make out of this is to sharpen our genie axes and learn how to extend our family trees, gather more photos and documents, and discover those remarkable family stories our descendants can benefit from for generations. Well, I have more time now, too, and I want to help you learn what you need to know. That's why I've created a new Facebook group, Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. I'm so pleased that so many of you have already signed up and are helping us to create a supportive community of family history researchers. On this page, we can brainstorm and share ideas on how to tear down those brick walls that we all have. 
So feel free to join us. The Facebook page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Feel at home with others who live in our genie world and want to make the most of this unique time. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Join us. All right, back at it for another edition of Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show on ExtremeGenes.com. This is where we answer your questions. And uh, Melanie McComb is with us today from the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And Melanie, our first question comes from Debbie Sargent Cravens. She said, I had my brother tested at Family Tree DNA and was told by those who are in the Sargent Family Project, our family surname, that he is not genetically related to the Sargent. So it sounds like he had a Y DNA test taken. We are both genetically related to my second great-grandfather, Moses Sargent, and his wife. Someone suggested that Moses might have been adopted. He was born in 1820, but no birth certificate. He lived most of his, uh, if not all of his life, in Loudoun, New Hampshire, could you think of other scenarios where the DNA does not match? Any ways to carry on traditional research to discover an adoption? Should one of us take more DNA tests? Could Moses' father have been the adopted person? I've been looking for Moses' parents for 40 years. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, Debbie. Well, here we go, Melanie. <laughs> A lot of hey, things Fisher. to cover here. It's great to have you on. Yes, yes, yes. Lots of great questions there. So you're right. There are going to be a couple different things to consider. One is that based on that time period, there are not going to be any statewide birth records. Right. Now, there could be something at the town level. So given that she knows about the town where he was born in, that'll be really helpful because a lot of those town records are going to be online on family search. So that would be one place to see, is there a birth recorded for that family right. in that town? And if not, then you need to look at like baptism records based on any churches they might have attended. Um, and that's important to understand is what religion they might have been attending to. Mostly it's going to be congregational churches, but you might see some early Methodists and other churches as well. So it's important to understand that. But I definitely do think more autosomal DNA will need to be done just to help determine because sure. until we know for sure that there actually is an adoption and there is that break, it'll be helpful to see if past the second great grandparent, are you getting third cousins, uh, fourth cousins that are coming up under the sergeant name at all? So that might be helpful too to see is it truly an actual a break in the in the DNA, or is it that the the person that um, was comparing the DNA of the sergeant maybe they had a break on their end? So that's something also to consider. I I would think though with a Y DNA test, you're going to wind up with the whole bunch of people that are similar for that family study, and that would be the question: Are you mismatching them, or are they mismatching you? Do you have other matches? It, and you might find that you actually match some other family in a Y test. You're getting a surname that comes up consistently that matches this Y test that might tell you what the line actually is because the, the reality is the break in the Y test could come anywhere. And if you, exactly, all, if, exactly. yeah, if you already know that you match Moses way back there, then uh, you might have to find out that Moses came through somebody else or his father or grandfather, as you suggest. Correct. Right. So it'll be helpful to test other male relatives that you know of in your family from the line to, to help test to see that everything is still consistently coming down, consistently a sergeant on that end, and then continuing to look for more distant cousins to continue to go back and to see where that break might have occurred and to try to pinpoint the exact generation. Yeah, and it's very difficult to do sometimes uh, to find that, oh, wait a minute, my name really wasn't my name. The same thing with my Fisher side. I don't believe my second great-grandfather's father, Fisher, was his father. And there are various reasons having to do with DNA, but uh, it's very difficult to prove when you get that far back. But great question, Debbie. Hope that's yeah. helpful to you to some extent. And you got a lot of work ahead of you, I think, still. But uh, nonetheless, you got to see who you're matching and if there's another name that comes up consistently among your Y matches. So thanks so much for that. We have another fascinating question from the revolution coming up for you here in just a few moments when we return for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show.
All right, we are back for our final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. We're doing Ask Us Anything with Melanie McComb. She's a genealogist with the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. And uh, Melanie, this question (laughs) is something I haven't heard before. It's from Heidi McCluskey, and she says, My friend recently found a Revolutionary War pension file where the soldier describes a battle he was in where the British shot dog heads at them. Well, we've done Google searches, asked staff at the Family History Library, and came up empty. And as you can imagine, we've had some pretty crazy guesses what the pensioner meant by dog heads. Any ideas? A $5 bet is riding on this. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you right now, Heidi, uh, we have been scrambling to find an answer for you as well. We've even brought David in on this, did a little conference call with him, and we have an answer for you. Yes. And what we think is being referred to in the pension is a dog lock musket. And this is referring to the piece of the gun, uh, the dog lock, which is sitting behind the cock of the gun. So it's more of a safety that's sitting behind it uh, when the flint's being loaded. So it's just another way to help make sure that, you know, you don't get uh, gunpowder blowing back in your face and making sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're ready to go before you fire off. And it was a very common gun used by the British and brought up into the colonies, everything. It would, it would definitely have been uh, something very valuable if one of the the colonists had actually picked one up from a soldier (laughs) and taken from them. So they were being fired upon They're being fired on some pretty good muskets. So um, they definitely were under some fire there and had to very much be careful because they had a pretty long range. They're very long guns. They're abusing the time. And I think they're even known as the perfect pirate musket. So apparently <laughs> pirates like to use them a lot. Oh, so. wow. Well, and, and specifically, it's the part of the flint lock or rifle that holds the flint and applies it to the gunpowder. But the reality is, is because it had that part, they, they referred to them as dog heads. And so that's what was shot. I can understand. I mean, the pictures in my mind when I first read this, wow. These British were really desperate to kill dogs and shoot their heads across <laughs> <laughs> yeah. at, at, at the Americans. That's just crazy stuff. So uh, hopefully you won your five dollar bet on that and, and that that answers yeah. your question. But that's pretty crazy. And, it, you know, it's not unusual too for different pieces of equipment to be named for unique parts or something that separates it from uh, other pieces of equipment that are somewhat similar, don't you think? Absolutely. And, and and even with some of these dog heads, we find that later on, there were even were pistols that were made up to actually resemble the face of a dog. So they definitely made them more <laughs> decorative. They're, they're, they're pieces of art. And it just gives it a little more character than just kind of a, you know, a standard pistol that would come up. So, is, if, so if you ever like, you know, search on those dog heads on Google, I'm sure that Heidi's uh, taking a look at, you know, you can definitely see where the imagination is coming in when they named a lot of these parts. Yeah. And I, I'm glad that we're just talking about a, a part of a rifle and not oh, actual agreed. dog exactly. head. Oh, agreed. Exactly. It was a bad enough war. We don't want to, you know, think of any more <laughs> inhumane things going on. Oh, that'd be t- I'm a dog guy. I love dogs. Exactly. But that would be just, we all love dogs. What a, you know, they were the greatest army in the world at that time. And to think that they would be doing that to try to gain an advantage in a battle is just uh, beyond belief. So there you go, Heidi. What a great question. And Melanie, yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for your help for oh, uh, Ask Us welcome. Anything this me. week. We are done for this time around, but we will talk to you again real soon, okay? Okay, sounds good. All right, and if you have a question for Ask Us Anything, it's easy enough to get us that question. Just email us at askusanything at extremegenes.com. Well, that wraps up the show for this week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks once again to Heather Mayo-Smith for coming on and talking about her incredible project, interviewing people who survived the Holocaust so that you can actually ask a question and they respond with the correct answer long after their past. And this is going to be a marvelous thing for history. And that technique, by the way, may actually help us to provide our own histories for our own descendants in the future. If you missed any of that conversation, you got to hear it on ExtremeGenes.com, iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, and Spotify. Talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 